Hey everybody, um, thank you for coming out. My name is Becky Given. I am the General Vice President of the Full-Time Faculty Grad Postdoc Union. You'll hear from folks from some of our other uh, unions tonight as well. And welcome to our Budget Town Hall. I'm gonna keep my um, introduction fairly brief because we have a lot uh, of great substance to, to uh, share with you, which I think will be fantastic. Uh, the way we're gonna proceed, uh, we're going to have uh, a lengthier presentation from Michelle Gittleman. She uh, chairs our union's uh, University Budget and Priority Committee, which could also be called as sort of a budget slash research committee. They do amazing research analysis, look at uh, what's actually going on with the university's budget, often compared with what the university is saying about its budget. So you'll hear um, a presentation from Michelle um, and then we'll have some follow-ups. Tara Matisse uh, will talk about the specifics on grant funding. And uh, Brian Sachs, president of our adjunct faculty union, will talk about what we're seeing so far with cuts. Um, we'll then have time for question and answer. Um, and then we will move to breakouts. I know not all of you will choose to stay for breakouts, but I would really encourage you. They're going to be by by campus and also one specifically for folks um, thinking about issues for PIs and folks with grants. Um, we will have additional budget analysis by unit available to you in your breakout. So you'll actually get more information, some very, very cool graphics to help visualize the budgets uh, of the different units. So um, it's worth sticking around for the breakouts, I, I would say. Um, that's kind of how we're gonna run down. You should uh, put your questions in the chat um, and we will be pulling from the chat to get to the Q, to use for the Q&A when we get to that. Uh, that part, we also do have folks uh, ready to answer your questions if they can be answered in the, in the chat. Um, we're going to record this meeting in the in the full session, um, and that'll be on our Freedom School YouTube channel afterwards. So uh, you can you can refer to it. Um, we're not going to initially share Michelle's whole slide presentation. Get in touch with us if you want specific pieces of it. But if you want to uh, direct colleagues, for example, to it, we suggest directing them to the video. We want people to have the full context of it. So there'll be ways for you to access the information, but we're not going to just put out a link to the slides right away. Um, I want to ask folks on the committee that worked so hard to put this together, um, if you could raise your Zoom hands, um, and that should, um, and maybe you can unspotlight me for a second. Um, and I just want to, uh, I want to, uh, to uh, show those folks and everybody get a chance. This is absolutely fantastic work. So you see these folks here, Mary Pat, Frank, Michelle, Howie, Tara, Alan, uh, and Trent on the staff side doing tremendous support. I really want to want to thank those guys. And when you see what you have, uh, what what's to come, you'll see you'll know how much work went went into this. So um, I, I want to thank you all for that. Um, I'll also say that the uh, Daily Targum has asked if, uh, if they could cover this town hall, and they are, I believe, here. Um, they uh, may and will report on what the main speakers ha uh, say. They're not going to be quoting anything uh, from the Q&A, the breakouts, or any participants. So uh, feel free to uh, raise uh, what you'd like to break. Um, and they, they won't be in the breakouts, but I did just want to flag uh, that, that, that they're here. And you'll likely see some reporting on this afterwards from our, our wonderful uh, campus journalists. Um, that with that said, I think I really want to get to the uh, to the uh, main event. So I'm going to hand things over to Michelle Gittleman, um, and I'll say uh, just that you're in for a treat. And I want to personally thank Michelle for uh, all the work she's done on on this issue. So um, thank you, Michelle. And Michelle will screen share, so you'll see uh, see her slides. Um, and over to you. Thank you. Hey. Um... Thanks, thanks, Becky. And when it's a treat to hear about budgets, that's that's really awesome. Uh, hi, everyone. Great to see you. I'm so glad we could do this. I'm going to get right into the 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 meat of it. Um, first of all, as Becky said, um, we are the University Budget and Priorities Committee. I want to give a shout out to the amazing group that has put so much hard work uh, into into different aspects and working together on analyzing the university finances, fantastic research. We've come out with a couple of written reports. There's an online panel you can watch. 
And we also collaborate with colleagues at other public universities. So what you're going to hear tonight really is the um, outcome of a very uh, group effort. Um, here's what I want to touch on, and I think I'm going to be about 25, maybe 30 minutes. I'm going to highlight our recent financial situation and address the question, are we in a deficit? It turns out that this is not a very straightforward question, so I'll take you through that. I want to go over what's been happening in the budget since COVID, introduce you to responsibility center management, which is quite important in understanding the inner workings of how our budgets and spending decisions are made, and give a spotlight on some of the campuses and units. And as Becky mentioned, the breakout rooms are going to be the time to really dig into the specifics for the campuses and the, the units. I'm not going to get into that here. All right, I'm going to open with um, um, President Holloway's address to the Senate about the budget this February, and um, and here he is. Uh, let's see. Oh gosh, I did it again. I didn't share sound. Let me share sound. Oh, I did. Okay. So you should, if you can't hear him when he speaks, uh, let me know. Uh, sorry, guys. I'm just. Here we go. Last year, I explained that we faced a structural deficit, and I discussed the major factors contributing to it, including inflation, a shift in overall enrollment, rising costs for health benefits, and the end of COVID relief funds. I explained that the administration would be embarking on a multi-year effort to eliminate this deficit, budgeted at $125 million. I'm here to assure you that we remain committed to that multi-year effort. Because Rutgers increased its revenue and took steps to control costs, we actually ended fiscal 2023 with a deficit of $88.5 million, drawing that from reserves. Better than budgeted, but still far below where we need to be. As we continue to reduce our deficit, I wanna be quite honest in telling you that as we develop the FY fiscal year 2025 financial plan, the state budget, which accounts for one fifth of our total revenues is very concerning. You only need to read the headlines to know that the state revenues are down and that we face an uncertain state budget environment. Okay, so this is a pretty um, grim picture. I encourage you to watch the whole thing because he lays out uh, a plan, but what he's basically saying is that we're in structural deficit, get ready for cuts, they are ongoing. COVID fund has ended and tr enrollment trends are bad and state support is very iffy. I wanna contrast that with some highlights from our 2023 financial statement, which just came out this March. And this is Michael Gower, who's our CFO, but here are some of the highlights from that. Our net position, uh, which is sort of like our net worth, increased by 61 million. Operating revenues are up 135 million. State appropriations, which Holloway just said are iffy, were up 8.4 million to a billion dollars. We had an 11% increase in sponsored research, reaching a record almost a billion. And we did get uh, COVID funds in 2023, 300 million, that's quite a lot of money, uh, which are earmarked for a medical project called Helix in New Brunswick. We also received, again, maintained our Moody's AAA3 rating, which is a very solid rating. It actually puts us in the top of sort of the second tier of all, all universities in the country. So we're public school, that's pretty good. There was some negative news. Our unrestricted reserves fell by 94 million. I'm going to talk about that in a second. And uh, quoting Gower, we closed the year with an operational deficit of approximately $88 million, a very challenging structural position that can only be sustained for a few years. And I'm emphasizing those words because they turn out to be quite important. Um, so Gower ends his letter in the financial report with the following, sort of an overview of, of, of dark storm clouds on the horizon. We must continue to monitor and be ready to respond to the impact of broad economic factors like inflation, workforce and enrollment pressures and other headwinds impacting higher ed in general. And to that end, a high priority is work to advance a financial sustainability plan one which would move the university over three to five years to balance the budget and generate net revenue. So that is meaning we're belt tightening. Uh, and I know that a lot of us are feeling that. 
Excuse so, me, Michelle. Could yes. you move the bar on that? Um, oh, can you see my bar? I'm so sorry. Yeah, we've done. It's been a while since I've been teaching on You're Zoom. You're right. So, I'm okay. good at interrupting. Very good, Sherry. And please interrupt me um, for anything like that. I don't know if I can make the bar disappear, but uh, I did my best. Is that okay? Is that better? All right. Yes. Um, good. All right. So we we sort of in the committee are have been grappling with this question of like, look, we are in actually really strong financial shape, about as good as we've ever been. And yet we're undergoing austerity and budget cuts. And so we're trying to reconcile all of this with what, what is going on. So that's kind of how I'm going to frame it. And I want to be able to explain this to you. First, just an overview of what I talked about earlier, our net position, which is kind of like an all-in uh, net worth bottom line. That's that dark blue, navy blue line there. And it's what is uh, left of assets after all liabilities are taken into account. What you see is that it's really been going up since 2017. We're at 4.3 billion, uh, uh, quite a, a nice growth rate there. Um, the, the lighter blue line is unrestricted reserves, also a very important number because it's, it's like rainy day funds. You can spend it on anything. And that's what people were looking at when COVID hit in 2020. Um, and look how it's been. Uh, so, 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 so that's an important liquidity measure. It has fallen by 94 million in the last year, but that followed three years of growth of 376 million. So overall, that's been a really good, solid financial performance in the last few years. The question of um, are we running deficits? Um, it kind of depends how you look at it. And I want to introduce you to two very important documents. One on the left is the annual audited financial report, which I just read you from, um, and that comes out in March. And the one on the right is our university budget. Um, that is details the budgets for all of the academic units. It's over 100 pages long. You can find your own uh, unit's budget there. Um, and it's a plan. It's not your actual budget, but it's the plan for the year. Turns out these two documents are quite different. The financial report is an audited report that's comprehensive. It shows all the inflows, all the outflows. The budget really only focuses on uh, direct flows from our operations. So it's really a, a, a restricted subset. And the question of are you in deficit depends where you look. According to the financial report all in last year, we had a $61 million surplus accounting for everything, but the budget shows uh, a 90 million deficit. Now, when the administration talks about deficits, it's talking about the budget, what's on the right, our operating budget. And I think it's important here, and that's my little, um, oh, I understand uh, meme, I see, um, to understand that these are used for very different uh, purposes. On the left, it's really for sort of auditors and creditors, but the budget is the managerial tool. It's what they're using to make decisions about spending, resource allocation, and cuts. So let me take you into the budget on the right um, and show you our surpluses and deficits. So a budget is revenues minus expenses. The green line, uh, Sherry, am I blocking this thing again with my little bar? Um, or is it the lower left? Yeah. Put it on the lower left. I'm blocking the... Now you've moved it to the top. Yeah, which I think works. Maybe the top is better. So Because uh, I have a lot of charts, so I want you guys to see the... The X axis. So the and I'll talk through what they're saying. So the the green line is our revenues from 2019 to 2023. The red line are expenses, and these are actuals. There was a little bit of a deficit in 2020. COVID hit, um, and then we ran a, nice surpluses for a couple of years. And this year, uh, this 88 million dollar deficit. And and look how expenses are in fact for one year rising faster than revenue. So that's not a good thing. You do want to be able to pay your expenses. So that's something of a concern. Um, but when Holloway says we face a structural deficit of 125 million, that's actually not the deficit that, that he's talking about. So let me tell you about structural deficits. What they do to calculate this is they take COVID funds out of the budget. And that gives this new structural deficit. And what the get, the goal here is to achieve budgets that are, again, sustainable. That's why that word is so important. We can carry it over time, 
by only focusing on the stable trends and taking out all the, the revenues that are considered temporary. So the cuts to the operating budgets that we are experiencing are being made based on the numbers produced by this structural deficit, um, taking out COVID funds. It's, I've spoken to a bunch of colleagues in public finance. Um, it's actually a somewhat of a common approach in public sector budgeting. It is very conservative, but it kind of helps understand why we experience austerity uh, even in periods of fiscal surpluses. And this goes for municipal and state budgets as well, um, and sort of helps us understand that contradiction. So I showed you earlier the actual budget. Um, this is the structural budget. It's not that different, and but this is revenues and expenses with the COVID money taken out, and we have a deficit in, in 2023 of 100 million. I want to point out that I um, was able to see the amount they took out using a document that shows $490 million in net COVID relief funds uh, that were removed from the budget to calculate this. Um, that's taken out in one fell swoop. We can't see when it's in where it's going. And my uh, colleague, our colleague Juan Gonzalez has been looking into this, but tracking where that money goes has been uh, nearly impossible. All right. Michelle, um, I'm going to interrupt you here and give you a little tech advice and post and you can get rid of that bar. I'm told completely. Thank you for the tech advice by doing this. If you have a Mac, Control Alt Shift plus H, and you can get. I've never it. owned a Mac or an iPhone, oh, so apologies. Yeah, <laughs> um, you can go to the more section on that little strip of control. Yeah, thank it says you. more, and if you click the more, it'll there'll be an option to say, click high uh, hide floating meeting controls. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Press oh. escape to show floating meeting controls. All right. There's still one. Thanks. There it goes. Perfect. And then when you need okay. it back, just hit escape. Got it. Thank you, voice, whoever that was. <laughs> um, all right. So I actually want to put the structural deficit and the deficit, the real deficit or the budget deficit. There is apparently no real deficit. No, it's how it depends on you into context. And what I showed you earlier was very expanded. This is showing you the budget. The green is our revenue. The red is our expenses over the last three years with the y-axis uh, set to zero. It just popped back. Um, and what you see is that our deficits are small. You know, $88 million on a $5 billion budget, which is extraordinary, is something to look at. You certainly don't want expenses exceeding revenues over a long period of time, but it's a very small amount. And I think the question that we are asking ourselves and why we're here is whether the austerity that we're experiencing and the cuts really are gonna create a, a structural impediment to our ability to continue to deliver really high quality education and research. So we have structural deficits that exist in theory, but we have real cuts uh, that are happening all over the university. Let me take you into the deficit now and show you um, what's been going up, what's been going down and show you some trends. So um, what this is showing is the change in actual budget spending between 2022 and 2023. So just one year of, of change. The left are our revenues. And what you see is like nice growth in grants, healthcare and state appropriation, which has gone up. This was pre-strike, pre-contract, um, and that's even going up more this year. And others can chime in on that. Tuition did fall, uh, tuition out of scholarship. And since 2019, we've had a small drop, 2,600 students since 2019. Now we have close to 60,000. So given that it was COVID, uh, that's you know a relatively small number, but the majority were international, which is um, undergraduates. So that's about sixty million dollars loss over four years. Um, it, it's a concern, uh, and and the committee and Frank Edwards is here. We're looking into long term enrollment trends. Uh, keeps popping back. Sorry about that. Um, on the right are the costs. Biggest costs in the budget: salaries and fringe have gone up, uh, but this other category, supplies and services, also significant increase. This is a one year snapshot. I wanna take you to look at the past uh, six years or so at trends. And this is the breakdown of revenues in the total revenue flow. 
And this is from our annual report. So this is all in, including increases on our investment portfolio, things that are left out of the budget. Whenever you're looking at a $5 billion uh, budget, you don't see a lot of big changes. It's very, very stable. I think the big news, sorry, every time someone comes in, my meeting control pop up. So I'm going to have to keep hiding it, I think, because I'm a co-host. <clears throat> um, I think the big headline for me is that in 2023, healthcare exceeded tuition as the number one source of revenue at the university. So I feel like that's kind of a milestone for our university, that healthcare revenues are are outpacing tuition as a number one source. Um, state appropriations has gone up slightly to 20, 22% of total revenue, tuition slightly down, grants are up. Um, that, that little green strip, the second from the top, that's COVID revenue. So that's what they're taking out when they calculate the structural deficits. I wanna show you the same kind of pattern for our cost or for our expenses. So, What's striking here, and for any university, is the preponderance of salaries and fringe and total expenses. That's these blue segments. But what you see is that since 2017, salary and fringe, it's stable, but it's actually declining as a proportion of the total. So things go up in nominal terms, especially because of inflation, but, um, but in terms of their share, salary is actually declining. Um, other things like, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm, trying to, uh, I just got, okay. Um, supplies, services, and other has actually increased as a share of our total. So when we see those expenses outpacing revenues, we really need to look at what's going on uh, with, with these supplies, services, other expenses, in particular, something called professional expenses was way over budget this particular year. Again, I'm not gonna get into too much detail. I just wanna show you these big picture um, trends. And getting back to the compensation question, I hope I'm not talking too fast. I feel like I'm stream of consciousness, but here we go. Um, I wanna show you trends in growth uh, of compensation. This is the consumer price index since 2019. And of course we had several years of very rapid inflation, which according to this has stabilized this year, um, albeit at a high level. Here's our compensation trends. I've broken it out into the red line is all in compensation to central. Uh, and we see that that is higher than the blue line, which is academic units. Now academic units is three times as large as central, but they have been, salaries have been below inflation um, since at least 2020 um, and only just tipped over in 2024 uh, as a result of our new contract. And Central generally embeds libraries in it. I had to break libraries out because the growth rate of salaries in libraries has really, really trailed the consumer price index. These are essentially wage cuts, as we know. Um, so I didn't want to bundle libraries in with the rest of, of Central. Um, I want to look at now the um, budget deficit by campus. And what we see is uh, New Brunswick, Newark, and Camden are all running deficits. By the way, the athletics division is bundled into New Brunswick as far as I understand it, and is a significant chunk of that. Um, what I think, and the RBHS is in surplus, the medical side. Um, what I think is notable here is that Camden is a 10th of the size of New Brunswick but has nearly the same deficit. So that's really a tremendous amount of financial pressure on Camden that we're looking at. I wanna get back to this slide uh, in a minute and ask what is going on in the campuses. In order to do that, I'm gonna to have to transition to talk about responsibility center management, which is our budget model implemented in 2014 under President Barchi. How am I doing on time? You're doing great, 7.26. Okay. What? About 10 minutes. Oh, okay, I think I'll be good. So 
I want to um, talk about what is responsibility center management. This is kind of what we had before. I, I think very visually, this is how I think about all funds budgeting, which was the all, prior system where the various schools are kind of standalone. Money comes into central. When you need money for something, you ask for it, you get it. So every year you get your expenses paid for. If you need some extra, if you have a good dean or, you know, you, you might get it. Um, but you have these standalone uh, units and nobody has responsibility for covering the, the profit and loss or the bottom line at the unit level. I think a responsibility centered management is looking like this apartment complex where every academic unit is an apartment and each of them is responsible for the covering their own budget. They earn their own revenues from enrollments and grants uh, and they have to pay their own costs out of their revenue. So they have to meet their expenses with, with revenues. But if you look at this, so everyone is kind of responsible for their budget here, and that's why it's called responsibility center management. But if you look at this building, there's a lot of shared costs. They have one boiler, they have one roof, they had one lawn. So who pays for that? And that's where um, these central cost pools come in, where each apartment or each unit is charged for the shared, their share of the shared costs. And I can kind of think of this whole building as a campus. So maybe that's New Brunswick and the one behind it is Newark and there's another one for Camden because they have shared overhead costs, right, on the campuses. So some of these costs are like uh, information technology, central administration itself, HR, plant, operations, maintenance, libraries. And those are what we call cost centers. Um, they're not responsible for meeting expenses because um, they don't have revenue, really. How do they get money? It's coming from the academic units. The surpluses coming out of the units go to pay for all this stuff. The cost pools are charged to each um, academic unit based on metrics that are supposed to correlate with the usage of the units. And the justification for this system is to create more transparency, better information, to decentralize decision-making, allow units to kind of chart their own course in life, and foster collaboration around the budget and collaboration around resources. So that's the theory. Um, let me take you a little bit into the mechanics of how RCM works, and then I'm gonna revisit some of those deficit figures at the campus level. I'm showing you the budget, the 2024 budget for New Brunswick School of Arts and Sciences. You'll see, a, and, and we're gonna make all of these available to you guys, um, and you, you can also download it from the web, but you see all the revenue items on top that are allocated back to SAS, and then the total revenues are $540 million. We then have all the expenses of which the majority is compensation, and those, add up to, and we can see the line items. So we can see what, what, what our costs are. The expenses are 421. Well, notice that that's a surplus, 119, but the, the central charges haven't been taken out yet. So those central charges are in the little box there, that 131 million, they're no longer called cost pools. They're now called administrative and facilities allocation. But when you take out the central charges, then we have the deficit of, um, uh, about a million dollars. It's close to zero, and that's how most units end up. But I just wanted to take you through the mechanics. And we've taken all this information and um, put it graphically, and I wanna share that with you here. This is exactly what you just saw uh, um, in a graphic form. And Mary Pat Ryder has put in so much work to make these for all the different units. So thank you, Mary Pat, also with Andres Morera and Matt Buckley. But what you see are the yellow is all the revenue coming into SAS, and the blue are the costs, the expenses. And immediately you see graphically, oh wow, you know, so much revenue is dependent on tuition, and so much expenses are just salary, and everything else is relatively small. But there's a surplus when you take out the direct expenses, that's that green line, and it's not insignificant, and that all goes to central. Um, with some adjustments, and it's supposed to be put into the come back or put, allocated um, back to the unit in some fashion. 
Um, so so we, we will make these available to you. I think it's a really a neat way of looking at what's going on at the unit level. But I wanna go back to thinking about campus deficits now with this understanding of RCM. So the blue lines are our net, the net deficit by campus. And remember I showed you that new, all three campuses are in deficit. But if you look at it before cost pools, New Brunswick and Newark have um, nice hefty surpluses and RVHS even more. So um, the deficits are being tipped out through the central cost pools um, um, at, you know, into central. And I'm gonna talk about the fact that we don't know how they're being allocated and moved around, but this chart is showing you the campus's aggregate data. I want, I'm gonna show it to you by student because then we can compare the, the campuses which are so different in size. And this is really an apples to apples comparison now. So this is dollars per student, full-time equivalent student. New Brunswick has a five, what is it? $6 surplus per student before the cost pool charges. Newark is higher per student in terms of its surplus. And Camden has a slight, slight, slight positive balance. Um, but if we look at cost pools and net of cost pools, what's interesting to me here is that per student, Newark and Camden are paying much higher than New Brunswick. And if cost pools are meant to correlate with overhead, then how do you have a metric where overhead is so much higher in Newark and Camden? And Newark is a quarter the size of New Brunswick. Camden is a tenth the size of New Brunswick. What by what metric do they have such higher overhead charges than New Brunswick? This I don't. I know that there's debt flows in here, and we can. Camden is a separate topic on that, but that's an. I think that's an interesting question to ask. I'm going to shoot you a complicated chart, which is all of the units that we have student data for. The blue line is per student surplus before the cost pool. Michelle, and the I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. You, have, you have about three minutes. Okay, I'm good. I'll be fine. Um, give me four. Um, and the the Navy um, three and a half. The Navy is the surplus after the cost pool. Um, and we can see a, most of the units are in surplus. Uh, some though, after the cost pool are in very deep deficit. Um, uh, so when the cost pool gets taken out, most units go to zero. And that's sort of how RCM is supposed to work, but a lot are in deficits. In particular to medical schools, Newark uh, School of Arts and Sciences, all the Camden units, very severe deficits and the Mason Grove School of the Art. There are stories in each of these, but I just wanted to show you this snapshot of the differences within the different campuses. And one of the issues is that we don't really have a sense of how these, um, these allocations are made. Um, I'm gonna share with you the result of a survey, uh, of a review that was done uh, in 2021 of RCM, a very high level commission of, of administrators and deans that found that the budget model, it came out very, very critical of the model. It impedes mission critical programs, including those that relate to PhD education, arts and humanities, DEI, and supporting students. It hinders interdisciplinarity and collaboration, creating unnecessary competition for students and complicating efforts to collaborate. And there's significant confusion over the mechanics of the model. Um, this is striking from that report. Of, they surveyed faculty and staff who are highly involved with the budget process, 90% disagree or are not sure that this is accurate, that the RCM model supports Rutgers in delivering academic excellence. 44% uh, strongly disagree with the statement, the RCM model provides strategic clarity for developing a coherent and collaborative Rutgers. So it's really not just those of us on the committee who are flummoxed by this, it's people who are deeply involved with the budget who are flummoxed by this. Um, so I'm gonna summarize. Um, some of the issues that we have with the implementation of RCM is a lack of information about how cost pools are charged and allocated across the units, how our money flows between and within the schools. So overall, the central charges are overhead, if you will, are 15% of revenue. It's not a crazy number, but it's over 15% for, for some units. What's driving these differences? 
Um, other schools have a lot more transparency. So for instance, Michigan charges a single rate. Everybody knows what it is. This is a somewhat specific point, but I think it's really important that our budgets are supposed to show both the direct local costs, but also the indirect costs that are paid for out of cost pools, and ours do not do that. So without having those full costed statements, the responsibility centers can't, can't manage their own budgets. And I think that's what a lot of uh, administrators are coming up against. And we, the, the academic units, are responsible for covering our own expenses, including paying for, for Central. Um, but Central is not accountable to the units for its spending decisions. So there's a real imbalance there. Just to sort of summarize, I have two slides left and then I'll be done. Um, the, the, the whole thing with the, the budget part in the front and the cost pools is that you know, the structural deficits are hypotheticals. They're very conservative, but the cuts are very real. And so we're having a lot of cuts that are happening despite an overall solid and improving financial situation. Um, and it, it's important to ask who's making decisions about these cuts. As uh, Mark Killingsworth said, some deficits are tolerated more than others. So for instance, athletics, you may love it, you may hate it. But President Barch, uh, I'm sorry, Barchi, President Holloway has said it's permanent. It will always be in deficit. He called it an investment. It's actually a cost center. It's a marketing expense. And he says it doesn't matter because it's tiny. Well, by that logic, Camden's deficit is tiny too, because the athletics deficit is, is nearly the size of the entire Camden campus. And Camden operates under severe stress. So why is one an investment, the other is not? We don't necessarily participate in these kinds of priorities. And as put by one law school administrator, Rutgers is a flagship public law school. And if it would be given a tenth of the money of athletics, if it was treated like an investment, it could be the Berkeley of the East Coast. All right. Um, will the mission survive the cuts? We do have, we're moving towards a race to the bottom competition among units to cut costs and win students. There's a whole slew of things. I know Brian's gonna talk about this. Tara's gonna talk about the cash flow stresses, particularly to the science faculty. Um, we have a lack of transparency that has persisted since it's been uh, implemented. And the academics units deserve to, uh, shared governance, to participate in, in important resource allocation decisions as practiced at other schools and mandated by the state. Um, I'm gonna leave you with this, which is from the state of New Jersey, which talking about RCM in 2017, when they audited us. Um, under RCM, CFOs are active participants in the budget and agree that RCM provides greater transparency. The CFOs are able to view all of the accounts and cost information for all of the campuses, not just their own, I think they mean chancellors here, uh, thereby allowing them an opportunity to test the calculations, make adjustments, and vet the amounts before reaching a collaborative agreement among themselves and the central budget office that the revenues and expenditures have been equitably distributed among the campuses. That's the aspiration. We are not there. I hope we can work together to make it so. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That's um, that's fantastic. Um, we yeah, we're just <laughs> so appreciative. I see some questions, and um, if more folks have questions, put them in the chat, and we'll be um, we'll be able to take some of them shortly. For those um, who weren't here quite at the beginning, um, the video will be available on our YouTube channel. If you have questions about specific slides or graphics. Um, get in touch and we can uh, figure out how to share specifics with you. Um, we're going to hear briefly from a couple more people to round out some of that um, information um, and then we'll go to the Q&A. So uh, first we are going to hear from Tara Matisse. She's professor of genetics and department chair and she'll talk a bit about uh, some of the challenges with, with grant funding. Um, and I'm going to share Tara's slides uh, in the chat as well, in case you want to look at them more. Thank you, Tara. Can you see them okay? Yes, thank you. Okay. Perfect. Excellent. All right. So let me be brief. I'm covering um, some of the contract related issues that are most relevant for grant funded PIs. Um, <clears throat> so let me just start by using a phrase that other people have coined that I think is perfect. Running a lab is like running a small business. 
we have to deal with funding. We have to write grants and think about, do we have enough money? We have to deal with staffing and make sure we have everybody we need in our labs. We have to really focus on our spending and make sure that we don't overspend or underspend. The government funders don't like that. Um, and of course, there's much, much more involved in running a lab, but those are some of the things we're gonna talk about here. And all of this is in addition to teaching and our service, just to say it's, it adds up to a very stressful job at many, much of the time. But we can't be successful in doing all of this if we don't have good support, in this case, from the university. Small business won't be successful without proper support either. Here, we need support for budgeting and tracking our spending, grant preparation and submission, and good, uh, good HR for hiring. Snarkity snark. All right. Um, so, sorry. Uh, in, the in our current contract, there were several things proposed, and I'm going to list some proposals and the outcomes that pertain, again, specifically to uh, scientific investigators here at Rutgers, PIs who are doing grant-funded research. So one proposal was that there be a central bridge fund, which would be used to support research during funding gaps. What was agreed to was to compile data on existing bridge funding and uh, that the university would meet with the union to further negotiate the idea of having centralized bridge funding. The second item was uh, development of centralized funds to support the cost of the salary increases that came with the contract. And the university did agree to cover unbudgeted salary increases if the departments cannot. And I'm gonna come back to each of these. And the third was to work collaboratively to reduce the high state fringe benefits rate. And university efforts there have been limited or not very transparent. If they're doing more, I'm not aware of it. And mostly they've been focused on requesting annual reimbursements. I'll get to this in more detail also in a second. So let's talk about bridge funding briefly. There were three parts to the bridge funding article that were supposed to happen. One was to collect data on existing bridge funding opportunities at the university. I searched the Office for Research website. I didn't see anything, um, but they do have a search bar where you can search in the website. I put in the word bridge and I found this link. I went back later and I looked over all the links on the website and I could not find this one there. So it does exist, but they don't seem to be making it very apparent or at least I couldn't find it. But if you go to this link, what you'll learn is that only RBHS has any kind of bridge funding available for FY 2024, assuming this website is accurate and current. All the units in Camden, New Brunswick, and Newark reported no, they don't have any bridge funding available right now. Uh, the second facet of this um, proposal in the contract was to uh, collect a database of grant-funded faculty with the office which the Office for Research has done. This may have already existed. I don't really know, but you can go to this website and, um, and look up all grant-funded faculty at Rutgers, or at least all that could be identified. And they did run a town hall uh, as they were also supposed to do. They talked about uh, some of these things a little bit. And I think they asked grant-funded faculty to get an ORCID, an ORC ID, which would make it easier for them to find you and link to you here. And then the last part of the bridge funding was to have these continued discussions and someone else on this um, town hall could indicate whether that's been happening or not, I don't know. The second item was central funding for salary increases. So again, there were substantial salary increases for postdocs and graduate students in the last contract, plus a salary increase for faculty. Many of these salaries are paid through grants or startup. That's what we're talking about here. The union negotiated centralized funding to cover these unbudgeted grant-funded salary increases. The postdocs got a great salary increase. The graduate students got a very nice salary increase. People paying these salaries off budgets have a fixed budget that was determined at the start of the grant, and therefore they don't really have money to all of a sudden start paying more salaries, higher salaries. So the state provided a digital additional budget for this purpose to the university and the university agreed that they would pay out that money. This only applies to grants that were in existence before the new contract. Grants that come about after the contract can budget accordingly. Central said they will pay, but they won't do it centrally. So therefore, 
units or faculty need to request to be reimbursed for these unbudgeted contract negotiated salary increases. Tara, I'm sorry, we're running low on time. Okie dokie. So um, it would be much better if the increase was never drawn from the grant. Not very many groups have requested the money um, or received it as far as we understand, but it's very hard to get that information. I will close out by just touching on the issue of high fringe benefit rates. Probably everyone is well aware of these things. Our fringe benefit rate has increased a ton. It's higher than other universities. It's higher than it needs to be to cover our actual benefits. So we're working hard to get it reduced. Um, we have got some money from the state to pay uh, reimbursements, actually 70 million in the current budget, but that's only for salaries that are on federal grants. Um, this reimbursement is not guaranteed for future years, which makes accurately projecting almost impossible. The union has been working very hard on this issue to try to get a new bill passed to permanently change and reduce the fringe rate to something much more appropriate. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tara. That's fantastic. And I'll just give a couple a couple of plugs. One is there will be a breakout room uh, that uh, emphasizes uh, especially grant issues. So um, you can uh, choose that breakout to uh, talk about that that more. And um, on the fringe, um, please keep in touch with with us in your union. We're working hard to try to get a legislative fix, not just uh, one-time appropriations, but um, actually a permanent fix uh, to that. We think it's essential to keep our research going. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Brian Sachs, president of the Adjunct Faculty Union, um, and he's going to talk a bit about what we're seeing in terms of cuts because of this uh, these supposed uh, budget issues. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Becky. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, you, you saw Michelle paint that really stark picture of the budget strategies that Rutgers employs to bolster its austerity narrative. And the RCM model provides the mechanism. Departments are on their own in their effort to pay their expenses. And even when they see surpluses, those are reduced or eliminated by the cost pool payments that flow back to an unaccountable central administration. And then the central administration relies on dean's offices to place further financial pressure on departments, which is what I want to talk about. Lately, that's been expressing itself, among other ways, in the form of an imperative for departments to cut instructional costs. Uh, and, and since budgets have been artificially tightened in the way that Michelle described, these calls for cuts, of course, resonate. But I'm here to say that we really need to find ways to take a stand against them for some of the reasons that I wanna lay out here and others. Uh, I can't present data yet, these things are ongoing, but currently the primary means of cutting instructional costs that we're hearing about in the lecturer's union are cut courses and raising the maximum enrollments for existing courses. And both of these strategies hurt lecturers, but they hurt students too. And they hurt full-time faculty in significant ways as well. And I just wanted to quickly recap some of them here. When class maximums are raised, student experience is risk, and that's counter to the core mission of the university. And when those maxims are, uh, maximums are significantly increased, as is happening in some departments, lecturers are effectively denied the fruits of the groundbreaking contract that we just won. Um, by virtue of our organizing last spring, lecturers won salaries that closed most, most of the gap that had opened between NTT and lecturer, lecturer pay rates over the past 10 years or so. Uh, so just for purposes of illustration, when a lecturer who may have taught three courses in the past of 40 students, say last spring, is now being asked to teach two courses with 60 students each, their raise is effectively wiped out while they carry a similar workload. And this illustration, by the way, closely resembles the circumstance that certain lecturers are currently facing. So class maximums being raised is one way, um, another way is just simply cutting lecturer courses. So when those courses are cut or shifted to NTTs, several detrimental processes can be put into motion. First, students who need the course that's cut may lose progress towards graduation. If that happens often enough, they could wind up having to take additional semesters to complete. Second, the lecturer is denied the opportunity to teach a class that they are familiar with or expert in, which and also could throw them into financial hardship needlessly. Third, 
uh, students who are enrolled in any canceled courses have to find new classes to take, which raises enrollments in courses other lecturers or full-time faculty are teaching. And finally, when uh, NTT loads are increased in order to accommodate cuts to lecturers' classes, a similar process of overburdening uh, unfolds and, and student experience gets similarly jeopardized. NTTs might rightly feel that they're being unfairly sped up and management succeeds in building enmity between different faculty cohorts. That's what we don't want to happen. And so in, in wrapping up here, um, of course, it's difficult to confront uh, an imperative for management to cut instructional costs. But what Michelle and the folks at the University Budget and Priorities Committee have really done here is give us some ammunition to push back against this demand. Lecturers need and are really depending on department chairs and uh, others in departments, our colleagues, to be advocates for maintaining our expertise and our courses. Unsurprisingly, management has gotten busy trying to find innovative ways to get around having to provide us the gains that we won in our last contract. And we understand the importance of addressing RCM. I mean, Michelle laid it out really well. We very much want that to be an issue in our next contract campaign. But in that effort, we'll need everyone on board, all of our Rutgers unions pulling together. Uh, and so speaking of that, uh, that contract campaign, that's still a couple of years in the future, uh, let's remember that we need to start now talking to all of our non-member colleagues. Our unions are enrolling a large recruitment effort. We all want to be part of that. Uh, we're always going to be stronger in any effort we undertake if we have greater union density. It all starts there. And so I think you're going to hear from uh, organizers uh, that will reach out and ask for your assistance in reaching potential members. We need all of us in this effort. And so um, thanks for listening to that pitch, and I hope everybody will get involved. Thanks, Thanks Brian. And I'll say I will have opportunities for you to join our recruitment drive to make sure that folks are union members. We can't do anything uh, without uh, without uh, people uh, in membership. So uh, we need all of you to participate, to reach out to your colleagues. I'll just say, underscoring what Brian said, that um, we have to stick together. We have to be all in this together. We didn't fight and strike and bargain together in order to stop uh, working together now, right? So it's really important for you to keep aware of what's going on in your department. Uh, not everybody who's full-time understands uh, who is hiring and, uh, and um, assigning classes to adjunct faculty. It's on all of us to make sure we're working together, we're staying, we're staying on top of uh, what's going on and we're pushing back when we need to. So, um, so uh, I, I just wanna give, the, give that plug. Um, on that note, uh, I'm going to move us to some questions. Uh, we have a little time for questions, and then we'll move uh, into some breakouts. Um, I'm going to keep this sort of uh, free form. I'm going to ask anybody who's on the committee that has done all the groundwork to volunteer to answer the questions. I'm not going to necessarily uh, assign them to a particular person. I'll ask you to jump in. Um, Belinda's question is about uh, is about uh, what we've often called administrative bloat. So what percentage of expenses are constituted not only by athletics, but also by the ever swelling ranks of useless overpaid administrators? So does someone want to talk about um, what we know about uh, administrator costs, administrator salaries? Um, who wants to jump in on that? You can raise your hand or just start talking. Go ahead, Michelle. I'm going to plead ignorance, and we have tried to look at this. Um, if you look at the Howard Bunces report online, um, he has a whole section on it, and I would go back and look at that. But the budgets mix in ground staff with Tony Calcato's office. You can look at the budget and see the, the office of the president. It's all available, senior vice presidents. But we don't have that, but that mixes in line administrators with top management. So I, I don't know if Trent, you. Trent, do you want to jump in on that? You don't have to, but if Trent McDonald from our staff who has looked a bit at payroll uh, wants to jump in, he can. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'll, I can throw the oh, numbers ahead, in. Trent. The... 
Yeah, I can throw the numbers in the chat. People don't just want to hear me reading numbers at them, but Alan's estimate is that it's about 11% of salaries uh, based on the most recent payroll data um, are managerial salaries. It's about 11%. Thank you. Oh, that's 960 of the top managers at Rutgers get approximately 11. That's about 3% of the workforce get about one out of every $9 that Rutgers pays out in salary. Thank you. And Andrew is on it. If you want to look at the Howard Bunces uh, presentation. Thank you, Andrew. That link is in the chat. Um, Shelby, I would love for you to uh, come off mute and come on camera and ask your question because I think it's pretty central if you're if you're able to. Sure. I, I just got back from teaching, so I changed immediately in pajamas and <laughs> excuse my appearance. But um, yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of read what I was what I said, but I was thinking about this as Michelle was speaking. Basically, the RCM, the responsibility, responsibility centered management style um, says that units are supposed to be responsible for their own costs. Each department is responsible for their own costs. But then uh, they only run deficits once Central takes an unknown, apparently indiscriminate amount out of their budgets. So in that sense, like, our, how is RCM actually supposed to work? In other words, if units are being tasked with budget balancing their budgets, but they don't know how much Central is going to take, aren't they being set up to fail? Aren't they being given basically an impossible task? And then contrary to the um i guess the the publicity about rcm it actually seems like instead of disseminating power among the units by giving them the ability to manage their budgets they're setting them up for an impossible task that they're going to fail at which actually then centralizes power back in uh, the central administration that is the only entity that knows what it's actually going to take out um so it seems like the theory of giving independence to units uh, is actually not true. In fact, it's just like they took the budget power and then kind of hold it over our heads and give us the impossible task of trying to balance the budgets without proper information. Um, I don't know if I just talked at you, but is that a correct reading? Uh, yes and no. Um, I, I think overall kind of yes. Um, they, the, when it comes to budgeting, the devil's in the details. And that's the, that's part of the answer here is that they design the budget model to have all this decision-making um, control. And by the way, all the money that, so, so, so um, everything might be as it's supposed to be in this budget model, but who's making the budget model administration is. Under RCM in theory, all the unit surplus does go back to the cost pool, but it's supposed to be published on the department budget. What portion is for space? What portion is for uh, whatever else maintenance? We're supposed to see what central is contributing towards these these costs in the, in the expenses rather, um, but we don't. We just see the, the the money taken out. And I just, if if I may, I want to speak to your point, Shelby, about units being responsible centered management. And I know our colleague Troy has, has Shimbrod has, has really talked about this, but it's kind of, a, it, it's sort of like a business that we have to cover our expenses and, and make money through, through enrollments and headcount and grants. And so they were always rushing to, to make more money and cut costs. And that's what Brian's talking about. But really um, when you step back, um, all of education and all of research is a cost center to, to society. We are not like a business. And the reason we're not like a business is we cannot monetize the value of the knowledge that we create. It walks out of our door every year and, and expresses itself over a lifetime. We cannot place a value on that. We cannot capture the value. We cannot make a profit from that. Education research is a cost center writ large. Um, so I want to um, make that distinction that we are not ever going to be able to run like a business, even though we're being held responsible for covering costs at the unit level. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. That that really clarifies basically that the the model doesn't work also because the the institution that it's being put upon is not a business model. Um, right. It's never going to be balanced. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shelby and Michelle. And I'm gonna, and I would uh, encourage you. We're gonna do one question, one more question, and then probably move to breakouts. If others wanna uh, help, help Michelle, uh, it's not only on her to answer these. Um, but I'm gonna go to Ed Cohen's question, which is again about 
uh, kind of in the category of what the hell are we doing here? How does the university legitimate its use of the quote unquote structural deficit to decide spending priorities? What's the sustainability model's vision of the university's pedagogical and research mission? It seems a purely financial model so that funding constitutes the university's raison d'etre rather than teaching or knowledge production. I'll say, I'll, um, I'll editorialize a little bit, um, Ed, and say that to me, it's a question of, do you uh, have an investment model or an extraction model, right? And so are we investing in things that are our priorities or are we just looking at where we can extract value? And right now it seems extremely extractive, but um, you know, I don't know if anyone, I know that folks on the committee have combed through like what Holloway and Gower uh, claim uh, about, you know, how these budgets represent good priorities. Um, I, I, so I don't know if you want to jump, jump in, Michelle, or if others uh, for, who've, who've been doing this work want to. I'm going to defer to others. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Anyone, anyone want to uh, jump in? on that or yeah go ahead alan yeah i think one of the things and and michelle has done a ton of work on this to help us understand a little bit more about what the structural deficit actually is i think that um you know the the thing that i took away from um you know of talking to michelle and and the presentation is that the university makes the most conservative possible estimates about um about income and revenue. Um, they take COVID out, they consider state funding um, to be going down, which is a possibly national trend, but it's not what's been happening in New Jersey. They use the most conservative possible estimates when they come up with the budget, which might make sense from a business point of view. But I think the point that Michelle made is very important is like if you start making cuts on that basis, the whole idea of raising revenue when you're making structural cuts that are going to impact the ability of Rutgers to actually draw in more students, to educate them to the standards that that people would like um, is is affected. And so there's there's this this vicious circle that's involved in making these conservative estimates of what a deficit, a structural deficit is going to be and justifying cuts that impact the possibility of actually raising revenues as Gower and, and Holloway say in um, their statements. They're in the financial report and in um, the budget address. Thanks, uh, Alan. And Donna, um, if you want to come on, on camera and mic and, and ask a question, and I know it's about a specific unit, and we'll use that to segue into our breakouts, which will focus more on the units, but let's hear your question here, Donna. Hi, thank you so much for this, Michelle, and everyone else. It's been super informative. My question is if people could speak briefly to what's going on with the SAS debt, because it is one of the largest, and really brutal austerity is being applied that's profoundly affecting some of our most prestigious programs. I find it particularly frustrating because the $20 million that we won from Phil Murphy at the bargaining table does not appear to be acknowledged in any way. So, you know, I think looking at the SAS debt in which we're not receiving our full tuition revenues, so non-majors who are taking SAS classes under this, each RCM is not a simple model, not a single model. It, it's changed and it's tweaked in many ways. So we're not actually getting our full revenues from non-majors. And this has had a devastating effect on SAS. So I'm wondering if people could speak to that. I, I, I don't. And I think that this is the um, the need. First of all, it speaks to the complexity of RCM and how it, it boils down into individual stories like this. And I think what you just said, you know, could be repeated for Camden, which has been drained for so many years through debt. Um, some debt is, I think, yeah, I think about Greece and the European Union and how the debt actually was really, really tiny. With, you know, they could have waved it away with a pen stroke, but Germany made them pay. They made them live through austerity and they really put them through tremendous financial stress. So these are decisions. And I, I would, I think our budget committee has to drill down to this level, Donna. Thank you for raising that and, and start to talk about these stories. That's really um, hard to hear. Thank you. Um, 
And I have to say, um, just Donna speaking up reminds me, we have to be vigilant about things like the libraries, right? The libraries are constantly under attack and they uh, are so, I mean, talk about an essential investment. And you'll notice, um, I saw this on an email thread from the folks on this wonderful budget committee, um, library spending seems to have gone up, but it seems to be mostly about this Elsevier contract, which in fairness will save some uh, folks with grants some publishing fees. Um, but um, but it doesn't really, it's just a, sh a shifting of money. It doesn't represent true investment in our, in our libraries. It doesn't represent, for example, recruiting more tenure track librarians, um, all, the, all the other pieces. So we really need to be vigilant.